The regional dimensions of Israel's genocidal war on Gaza majorly escalated on Monday when Israel attacked an Iranian consulate in Damascus in Syria. Two commanders of Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps were among those killed in the attack. Now, diplomatic buildings are afforded protections under the Vienna Convention and the attack has been widely condemned both across the region and internationally, including by UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres. On Tuesday, the attack was discussed at a meeting of the UN Security Council. We go to Abdul for more details. Abdul, thank you so much for joining us. So, uh, quite a few tense days in West Asia as a whole, starting with that attack on the brutal attack on an embassy, a diplomatic a diplomatic office in the Syrian capital Damascus, followed by a you know chorus of condemnation. Now on Tuesday, we had the UN Security Council session as well. Maybe could you first take us to the attack itself, what we know about that, and then we'll come to the UN Security Council session. Uh, well, Prashant, on Monday, uh, Israel carried out an airstrike uh, inside Damascus. You can say the uh, the diplomatic area where most of the uh, embassies and other foreign offices are located. And in, in that attack, uh, Iranian consulate building uh, was uh, hit in which uh, at least uh, seven uh, Iranian officials including two top generals of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps were killed and six other uh, uh, Syrian citizens were also uh, uh, killed. Um, uh, this is, of course, uh, was a, a part of Israel's, you can say, military campaign, which is going on for uh, a decade, over a decade now, but uh, it has increased post-October 7 uh, war in Gaza. Uh, of course, uh, Israel has not claimed the responsibility yet, but uh, 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 various other sources have confirmed that this is uh, uh, Israelis were res uh, responsible, and um, and on basis of that attack, uh, there was a special session called uh, to, uh, of the United Nations Security Council called to discuss it because this is this uh, amounts to violation of uh, international conventions and international law which basically uh, provides immunity uh, to all the diplomatic buildings and diplomatic enclaves from all such kind of attacks even during the uh, days of the war and this is a clear violation of uh, all those uh, conventions and laws. Right, uh, Abdul, in this context, what are some of the arguments that came up during the Security Council session? Well, uh, during the session, which was called by Russians and, of course, uh, supported by other members like China and Iran, in which uh, uh, primarily uh, two things have been discussed. One, of course, the UN Security uh, Secretary General and uh, other officials expressed condemnation to what Israel uh, did uh, because of course uh, as i said before this uh, this amounts to violation of the international law and violates to uh, violation of the diplomatic immunity uh, which uh, most of the diplomats are uh, all the diplomats are subjected to uh, and at, but at the same time there was a, a criticism on the line that this is basically a provocation uh, uh, carried out by israel uh, not only violating the UN Charter and violating the Syrian sovereignty, but also uh, 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 an attempt to basically escalate the war which is going on in, uh, in Palestine. Uh, this can lead to uh, reactions and counter-reactions which can uh, spread to the region and uh, 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 which can create a regional war. And that's what uh, the position was taken by Russians. Uh, Iranians also uh, said the same thing and they demanded that there should be an action by the United Nations Security Council uh, against Israel's repeated provoca provocative acts inside Syria. Uh, 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 of course, this they also uh, linked it with Israel's uh, repeated violation of United Nations Security Council resolutions, particularly the resolutions related to the ceasefire in Gaza, and they demanded a punitive action against Israel. But of course, uh, if you see uh, the responses from the uh, U.S. Uh, claiming that they do not yet know whether the building which was targeted was a diplomatic uh, building or not. If it was a diplomatic uh, uh, building, it, if it was Iranian consulate, they condemn the act. But since they do not know, they do not want to uh, formally condemn Israel. Uh, and similar things were repeated by uh, its allies like UK and France. In fact, they blamed Iranians 
for uh, inviting attack from Israeli inside uh, Damascus. Uh, and that led to a division of, uh, you can say, the members of the United Nations Security Council. But um, other members condemned uh, the act and demanded act, uh, punitive actions against Israelis. Right. Abdul, and finally, how do you sort of see this latest bombing specifically? You know, what does it mean for the escalating tensions in the region as a whole? We have talked about this on various occasions. The fact that the Israeli offensive on Gaza has not stopped with Gaza, despite the catastrophic toll, it has actually escalated to the entire region as a whole. Well, Prashant, this is uh, uh, nothing less than a provocation uh, for uh, further escalation. And uh, as we have discussed uh, earlier, uh, Israeli government at this moment uh, wants to escalate the war and, and does not want to end it, uh, despite the United Nations Security Council resolution for ceasefire uh, and other pressures. Primarily, not only because uh, there is uh, a stake, Netanyahu government's uh, survival is at stake, but also because uh, escalation of war would invite greater uh, involvement from the U.S. and so on and so, which is not there so uh, there at so far. And therefore, Israel is using every opportunity to provoke the war. So the attack uh, in uh, Syria, despite the warnings. Uh, is basically deliberate. Uh, you can link it with the uh, recent attacks on the uh, uh, international aid workers inside Gaza. Uh, despite knowing everything, uh, every detail about involvement of foreign uh, play, uh, foreign activists uh, uh, in, in, in the aid uh, delivery, Israel chose to basically attack those aid workers. So there seems to be a, a deliberate attempt to basically target uh, uh, multiple uh, 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 centers so that uh, the war escalates and more and more players are involved in the reason. And, and, and there is no other explanation at this moment, which basically, because uh, this cannot be an accident that uh, one after the other international uh, 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 regional centers are being targeted and even international players are being targeted by Israel. Thank you so much, Abdul, for that update. Our next segment is about the perennially controversial pandemic treaty. Another round of negotiations failed recently and there are questions about whether a draft will be ready for adoption at the World Health Assembly in May. Now to remind our viewers, this treaty seeks to institutionalize the lessons from the COVID-19 experience so that the world may be ready if a new pandemic breaks out. Now the only problem is that the richer countries and the poorer countries have very different ideas of what lessons we should learn. Richer countries have been reluctant to accept provisions which would ensure better equity and sharing of resources and funding for public health. We go to Jyotsna to see why these negotiations failed and what lies ahead. Jyotsna, every few weeks we seem to come back to the discussions around the pandemic treaty and there seems to be negative news quite often and yet again another round of discussions has failed. So could you give us a bird's eye view of sort of why uh, you know, these negotiations failed and what, you know, what are the factors that contributed? Yeah, I mean, we talk about it often and unfortunately, there is nothing new to talk about. That is a sad state of affairs. Um, so the recently concluded pandemic treaty negotiations, which actually lasted for 10 days, um, again, they seem to have failed and I would say failed because we do not see uh, what we have actually seen is that the text uh, has broadened. It has only added more and more numbers of pages. Uh, though, I mean, if the negotiations proceed in general, the text becomes, uh, the pages become leaner and thinner because then you're arriving at consensus and extra text gets, uh, goes out of the uh, the, negotiate, the negotiations. But that is not happening. And that is because the developed countries are not letting uh, the negotiations go forward. There are things which developing countries have clarified in uh, as many words that they will not accept uh, or what they want. And those issues, uh, the developed countries, especially the US, are just not taking on board. And again, I would say the entire thing of access and benefit sharing uh, is something that developed countries are holding on to. They are making it obligatory on everyone, especially the developing countries, to give data uh, um, free of cost, put it in public domain um, about pathogens, newly emerging pathogens, etc. 
but they are not saying that they will share monetary or non-monetary benefits with the developing countries for all of this. And it will cost money because surveillance costs money. So it is not that it is coming free of cost for anyone, but then there is no corresponding benefit that uh, the countries uh, uh, are uh, uh, seem to be getting developing countries. Uh, for example, they're also saying that if we actually talk about equity, then what we need is, um, uh, and when I say non-monetary compensation or non-monetary benefits, uh, that you give us the technology to produce uh, the vaccines and medicines and other tools during a pandemic. Uh, because we saw that there was definitely lack of all of this, which led to a lot of deaths and other sorts of devastation. So the developed countries are not accepting these. There, there are still concerns about uh, intellectual property and the kind of things that exist in R&D. There is a major concern again throughout the text uh, where uh, a lot of things are still obligatory and while, uh, sorry, where things are uh, 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 voluntary by the people and the developed countries and the pharma companies to give uh, and not mandatory done. So till we do not have a language to make it obligate on people to share information and not impose intellectual property barriers and many other issues, till it is not obligatory, till it is only uh, voluntary, it won't work. We saw voluntary mechanisms did not work during COVID. It, they simply did not work. Um, so we are standing in the same place. And um, so that is um, where we are. Uh, but uh, if I, uh, you talk about next steps, what are the next steps uh, 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 in the next few months? Um, so because these negotiations failed, the WHO has said that based on these negotiations, a text will be put in the public domain by 18th of April in English and translated versions later. And there will again be negotiations starting uh, end of April, which will go till 10th of March before the World Health Assembly, which Tenth starts May, right? uh, late, in Ma uh, late in May. So, Joseph, in this context, I think there's also been uh, a certain set of demands or proposals by uh, civil society groups regarding the financial aspect of this pandemic treaty. What are the, What is the money involved? How can it be raised? How, Or rather, how can, for instance, developing countries benefit in this context? Could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so there is a, a group of countries led by Indonesia, which is called the Group of Equity. Um, and one of their major demands is about uh, talking about equity in financial aspects uh, during a pandemic also. Uh, so they are saying the uh, uh, the fund, whichever fund is created for the pandemic, uh, the WHO's member states should have the control over it and they should monitor it. And this, they have to say it because what, at the level of UN, uh, they are talking about having a fund which actually be hosted by the World Bank, where the member states do not have much of a say. It has a very different structure. WHO is more democratic in that fashion. Or even the G20, a group of 20, those countries, they are also asking about talking about a pandemic fund but again it is not with the who and we know that every country's uh capacity is not same when we talk about g20 it is um it is extremely uh, i mean the power there is held in our hands of certain countries the developed countries so uh, to make it more democratic it will be good to have that fund being monitored by the who which is led by member states um so that is one but there is also a larger understanding standing within the civil society when it comes to financial matters. Um, for example, what we saw during COVID is that something that could have given more money in the hands of the developing countries, especially the LDCs, the least developed countries, say in Africa and many others, uh, that uh, could have been done uh, by cancelling their debts, the uh, World Bank cancelling their debts and the IMF and many other uh, such mechanisms. Um, so that should uh, also become inbuilt. Uh, when we talk about uh, the pandemic. Also, having a better global tax regime could uh, help. Um, the other thing is that even in the pandemic, they are talking about some sort of financial mechanism without exactly uh, spelling out what does that mean and how will we go about it. So all of these things uh, should be taken care of and a robust equitable mechanism uh, of funding should be developed, which if just we talk about it in very, very simple terms, it would be a differentiated uh, responsibility uh, where the developed countries, because 
uh, of the kind of exploitative system we have um, across uh, in all aspects and financial aspects. Uh, so developed countries have more resources. So they should be feed, uh, feeding in more resources, taking more responsibility at, at that front. And a lot of uh, uh, other work would come from the developing countries. They will share their skills. They will ensure that the production of vaccines, et cetera, would happen on their land which will make it cheaper for everybody to access. And not just for developing countries, even developed countries, poor people. And we know about the blacks in US who did not have access to the vaccines and medicines in time. So if the developing countries uh, uh, could produce, there would be more products available and even they would have benefited. So in uh, all these terms, uh, so the developed countries will pull in money and uh, which can benefit uh, everyone across the world. Uh, so, so those are the proposals that have come. Uh, again, uh, we are nowhere close to talking about it. In fact, those people who were on ground in Geneva, uh, uh, talking, uh, are, uh, monitoring and following the negotiations, they say the whispers are right now, either there will be a 20 page lean text which is quite unlikely, or the negotiations will extend beyond May. Um, right. And uh, I would say, yeah, one of these two things should happen. We should not have a bad treaty because that will be worse than having no treaty at all. Thank you so much, Jolta, for the update. And that's all we have in today's Daily Debrief. We'll be back with a fresh episode tomorrow. Meanwhile, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all the social media platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button.